century, specifically if you were in the Continental Line's Infantry Division. Now, the way victory is defined in the 18th century, at least during the Revolutionary War, it's not going to be like it is in these, these movies, these TV shows that we watch depicting this time period, where victory is really defined by one thing, doing what to the enemy on that field? <laughs> yeah, just pounding them into the ground, right? Just destroying them, causing as much mass casualties and destruction as we can, just laying waste to them on the field. Well, that's not necessarily our goal. For the most part, the Revolutionary War was a war of territory. You know, so when we're on that battlefield, our goal isn't necessarily to take the enemy's lives here. Our goal is to take the ground that's directly beneath their feet. We want that battlefield. The way you win is by taking the battlefield away from the enemy, pushing them off of that field, holding troops to that position, holding that position as long as you can. That's really how you're going to win. Now, the way the Army is going to be doing this, at least in the infantry, because the reason I specify the infantry, different soldiers are going to have different jobs in the Army, is, well, we're doing something very similar to what the British are doing in this time period, which is the grand idea of linear formations or linear tactics. Have we ever heard of this? Seen this? Movies, TV shows, even read about it in books? This is the grand idea of having soldiers stand elbow to elbow, shoulder to shoulder, just like this, on an open battlefield while the enemy's doing what at you? Yeah, shooting at you. Now, there's a reason I say it like that. At face value, does that seem like a grand plan? <laughs> yeah, probably not, especially when you compare it to modern day tactics, you know, some of the modern day weapons that we have, right? But you have to understand a few things about the weapon the infantry is taking into battle. I'm going to call this a smoothbore flintlock musket. Now, everything you need to know about how this weapon works is in its title. I call this a smoothbore musket because this is very unlike a weapon of its time, a weapon very similar to it of the time period called a long rifle. Now, a long rifle and a musket are different in that a rifle has exactly that, rifling grooves going in and out of the barrel right here, making sure that when I squeeze the trigger on that piece, that ammunition is traveling in a straight line. It's going to go wherever I point the weapon. Right, okay, so the range of that long rifle is going to be anywhere from 200 to 300 yards, and it is a fairly consistent weapon. I can actually hit a target almost every time with that piece, provided I'm a good shot, provided I'm a properly trained rifleman. But with this musket, well, there is nothing in or about this weapon that is going to guarantee its accuracy. So right away, I call this a smoothbore gun because when I finish loading this weapon, I'll make ready, take aim, I'll fire the piece all the way down range. I can effectively hit a man-sized target at about 100 yards away. Hopefully there isn't a National Park Service person right over there at the moment. <laughs> uh, so, But that's what we're hoping with this weapon, about a football field in range. That's what you're going to get. Now, when you compare it to that rifle, that does raise a very important question. <laughs> that rifle has a range of 300 yards. This weapon has a range of 100, so why on earth aren't we firing that rifle? on the battlefield. Well, it has to do with the reload speed of this weapon. So the way this weapon works, the way I fire it, is through a system of flint and steel. Much like that long rifle, I have a piece of flint, piece of steel right here. I'm going to squeeze the trigger and watch right about on the outside of this priming plate. Right there. Those sparks you saw are actually bits of steel that I'm scraping off of this hammer plate. Those sparks are going to travel down into a priming pan full of gunpowder. And once those sparks hit that gunpowder, what happens? Yeah, kaboom. All right, okay, it's actually going to send a controlled explosion all the way from the outside on that priming pan all the way through a small hole that's been bored out in the gun barrel right about there. And what's going to happen is going to set off the rest of my loading powder and then, well, we have liftoff. All right, okay, so all the moving parts that go into making this weapon fire should take one well-trained Continental soldier about 15 to 20 seconds. That's why we like this weapon despite its range, despite its inconsistent accuracy. Because that long rifle I mentioned earlier, that weapon is going to have about a 60 second reload time. Yeah. So if you're on an active battlefield, which would you prefer? 15 seconds per volley or 60? I think I'd prefer 15 seconds, right? Yeah, it's not the most accurate weapon in the world, but I can actually fire more shots with this weapon in the least amount of time possible, right? So that's why we have this piece. Now, the reason we're using these linear formations, first reason really has to do with the weapon. Second reason has to do with us and the way that we work as soldiers. So let's talk about this weapon for a second. One shot every 15 to 20 seconds, and when I fire this weapon, I can hope to hit a man-sized target somewhere within 100 yards. If I'm looking to scare the enemy today, is Juwan or a few of these shots going to do it? Because one or a few of these shots probably isn't going to hit a whole lot. <laughs> right, okay, so instead of just a few of these weapons going off, what we're going to do is have this entire section that I'm standing in, we're all going to prime and load, we're all going to make ready, take aim, fire at the exact same moment in the exact same direction. So what you have now is essentially 100 shots being fired at around the same time. 
So let's say you're on the receiving end of that. You're a British soldier. That first volley comes through. You're in the middle of priming and loading your musket. And well, the guy right here, he just fell down. By the time you finish priming and loading that musket, second volley comes through. That guy just fell down. The third volley's coming. You haven't even fired one shot yet. How you doing? <sighs> Anybody sticking around? <laughs> If the answer is no, good. <laughs> okay, because again, you run off that battlefield, we can move troops up to your position, and well, we just won. Right, okay, so that's the first thing we're accomplishing with these tactics, massive firing patterns called volume of fire or rate of fire. We're going to see how many rounds of ammunition we can fire downrange at the enemy in really the least amount of time possible. I'm not really going to be discriminant with these weapons. I'm just going to go ahead and fire it all the way downrange at your section, knowing that I'm going to start poking holes out through your lines. That's really the more important thing here. This weapon is not necessarily used to cause mass casualties. It is used to cause mass confusion on the other side of the battlefield. Now, as we get closer with this weapon, yeah, I'm possibly going to cause mass casualties because the closer I get with a fairly inconsistent or in inaccurate weapon, what does this become? The closer and closer that we get downrange. It's going to get a little more accurate the closer that we get, right? So that's something we have going for us. But the second reason we're using these tactics, folks, like I said, doesn't have so much to do with this weapon. It has more to do with us. Let's say for sake of example, just for today, that I am hiding behind that tree, hiding behind that bush, hiding behind that rock, ambushing the enemy from all sides. That actually is something some soldiers in the Continental Army were doing, but not these frontline troops, because frontline troops, they need to hear something throughout the course of that battle, preferably from my commanding officer. What do I need to hear constantly from that guy? One of those things, yeah, commands, orders, instructions on what the heck to do out there. If I'm all the way back there somewhere, getting all the cover and concealment in the world, which is great, but if the fight takes place here, am I doing my army any good? Am I doing my section of soldiers any good? No, because the only sound I can hear way over there is what? Yeah, the sound of that gunshot right there. And guess what, standing in these linear formations still the only sound I'm going to hear is probably the ones coming out of these weapons. But standing in these linear formations, elbow to elbow, shoulder to shoulder, what I do have going for me right here is I can always look to my left, look to my right. I can see what those commands are. I have no excuses not to follow along with the rest of my section. And if I still can't see anything, because, well, have you ever heard the term fog of war? <laughs> that fog, that smoke on the field gets so thick I can't even see the hand in front of my face. That's why we have a musician on the battlefield. If you ever wonder whether there's a uh, drummer, a fifer on the battlefield, that is his job. Actually beat out a cadence or to play those commands out. So if I can't hear it over these gunshots, I'm definitely going to hear it from the drummer. If I can't hear it from the drummer, I'm going to see it from my linear formations. There's no excuses here not to coordinate with everybody else. But that's why we're using these tactics, folks. Two main reasons. Coordination and mobility in numbers and volume of fire. That's really what it comes down to, the reason we're standing like this. Now, there's one more weapon on this tool I can use to push the enemy away today. What's this called? Yeah, my bayonet. Now, as far as using this bayonet, I'll go ahead and demonstrate how complicated this weapon is real quick. That's it. Yeah, so just a very quick, one-directional weapon. Yeah, so that being said, the whole point of this piece isn't necessarily to use it. Because, well, what does the enemy also have? A, another foot and a half long spear. All right, okay, I don't necessarily want to deal with that. Don't want to be in the receiving end of that. And guess what? Neither does the enemy. So as we notice, as we keep on marching up to the field, firing from an even closer distance, firing from an even closer distance, we notice that the enemy is trying to rally themselves back together, fill in these gaps in the ranks we've been poking out this entire time. And our commanding officer, as he notices the enemy do this, he's going to give us another command from the shoulder. Charge, bayonets, we're going to drop the weapon all the way down at our hip. I want you to imagine 100 men doing that all at the same time in sync with each other. And now from this position, they're going to start running, sprinting, screaming at the top of their lungs all the way down there. So what started off as a volley of 100 shots every few seconds is now 100 spears are charging at you. Anybody still in the field? I don't think anybody here is. All right, okay. The more I learn about these tactics, the more I realize I probably run too. Yeah, so because, well, hand-to-hand -hand combat in any time period, is it fun? Not like it is in the movies. <laughs> yeah, so no, we don't really want to end up on the receiving end of one of these tools. So this tool is going to be used to finally push the enemy off of that field once and for all. Now, of course, folks, these tactics, these ideas, these theories, they are completely useless unless I can actually fire this thing, right? So like I said, it should take one well-trained Continental soldier about 15 to 20 seconds to load this piece. That being said, I have about 12 steps that I have to go through to actually meet that mark. I'm going to go ahead and show you what those are. 
So from the shoulder fire lock position, from here, folks, I'm going to go to that first command, which is half cock fire lock. I'm going to bring the piece up, take a horizontal step back with the weapon. Now from here, I'm going to open that priming pan up, exposing that pan for powder. From this position, I'm going to go to handle cartridge all the way out of my shot box. I'm going to eat some gunpowder and hold it at my chin until I hear that next command, prime. I'm going to pour some powder in next to the vent hole of the weapon, shutting that pan off, cast the piece about at my hip, and charge cartridge all the way the rest down the gun barrel. Draw a rammer, advance it down the muzzle, knocking my bayonet off at the same time. Ram down that cartridge. Once I do this, I'm going to feed the ramrod back down and return rammer. From here, I shoulder fire lock. Now, I'm ready to fire this weapon. Now, your context here, am I doing this on an active battlefield while I'm getting shot at? Okay, you're nodding yes. Do you see something I don't? <laughs> yeah, so no, that's your context there. I'm doing this at a museum today. I'm not on an active battlefield, am I? <laughs> yeah, so bear that in mind, folks. If you want to go ahead and cover up ears, this is where it can get a little bit loud. All right, so. Mike ready. Take aim. Fire. Time load. From here, I'm going to do it all over again. Now, you notice when I drew that cartridge out, I actually had it fumbled in my fingers. And I'm not even getting shot at right now. Mac ready. Take aim. Fire. And then from there, I would do that all over again. Now, this particular demonstration, I'm actually very happy with it because, well, the weapon actually went off when I wanted it to. Right, okay, which I love. I love that. Right, okay, but that's not always the case. A third reason we're possibly using these linear formations is because, well, I'm going to go ahead and make ready, take aim, and I'll hear this noise. Uh-oh. <laughs> what I'm going to have to do is fix that misfire, fix that problem while the enemy is advancing on our position. And while I'm doing this, you're covering my back, right? <laughs> no. Get out the cam. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, so hopefully somebody here will cover me while I fix this problem. So again, coordination, mobility in numbers, volume of fire, folks. That's what these tactics come down to. That's how you win. Mm. Hopefully. Mm. Yeah, so thank you for coming out today, folks. Mm.